It's the Real Estate Podcast, brought to you by ANZ Home Loans for financial well-beings. And welcome back to another episode of the Real Estate Breakfast, available on iHeartRadio every morning and on Spotify and Apple and wherever you get your good podcast from. Well, it's Friday morning. The week has rattled past once again pretty fast. It's the 18th day for November for 2022. And a couple of days ago, Trump declared that he was running again. I don't think there was any great surprise here in the 2024. For U.S. elections, he invited his adoring supporters to Mar-a-Lago, his residence there in Florida. And despite what you think of Trump, if you focus on this property, Mar-a-Lago, from an investment point of view, this property is probably turned out to be one of his best investments. Trump paid an estimated $10 million for it back in 1985. This year, of course, the Trump organisation touted its value at $500 million, probably a little bit inflated. Rich Harvey, you would probably love to have this in your portfolio. Well, anything that's a good money spinner like this, but I mean, this this club has got notoriety because Trump's involved. But from what I understand, he paid what ten million for it, and Forbes valued it at around three hundred and fifty. So that's like a thirty-five time return on investment. So I'd love a, an investment like that in my portfolio, absolutely. But I think it obviously gets a significant uplift simply because of Trump's notoriety and people wanting to rub shoulders with an ex-president. We talk with leading property commentators with analysis, predictions, forecasts, and what's trending every morning from 6.30. It's the Main Centre Forecast with PRD, selling smarter every day. Checking on your weather on this Friday morning, and first we go to Sydney, expecting blue skies with sunshine in 22 degrees. 23 is the forecast high in Melbourne, also sunshine, and in Brisbane, expecting Expecting blue skies with 27 and in Perth today expecting some wet stuff 17 degrees and showers for you in Perth. It's your weekday real estate breakfast with news, interviews and predictions every morning on the Real Estate Podcast. Let's Talk Property, a podcast series with Rich Harvey. So are you keeping up with the interest rate rises? There is no doubt that the Australians have been smashed around with seven consecutive interest rate rises this year. And the Ukraine conflict isn't helping with this, nor is the existing global supply chain issues. Have we seen the full impact of these interest rate rises, though? And how many more are possibly coming? Well, to discuss this more, Rich Harvey, of course, it is a Friday is back, CEO of propertybuyer.com.au. And Rich, I've heard that you've mentioned it before in a previous life that you were an economist. Good morning, Craig. Good to be with you. Yes, I was. I worked in government for 10 years as a principal and senior economist, crunching the numbers and doing cost benefit analysis in my sleep. So I think that that actually helps for the first question, because a lot of people won't realise that it takes time for each of these interest rate hikes to filter through to the economy. So perhaps firstly, explain to people how long that takes. Yeah, typically it used to be said that the impact of an interest rate change would take around 12 to 18 months to filter through. And you could argue that the housing market impact takes even longer. So for example, if you've got like an off the plan apartment sale, that apartment project will get a tick at the beginning of the project, but it may not be delivered for two or three years. But if sales are slow and the development projects are mothballed or scrapped, there can be a long time period before new housing supply really begins to pick up meaningfully. So typically interest rate rises now, I believe, they typically take around six to nine months to filter through but there's always a lag effect. So at the moment, the interest rates are there to try and reduce inflation, to get it back down from its 8% level to its 2% to 3% band. And we're already seeing the impacts of that now. We're seeing a dramatic drop in building approvals. We're seeing off-the-plan sales really slow down, construction loans slowing down, and a lot of developers and people even doing renovations are putting them on hold. The thing is, what we've had since June or since May, since all of these interest rate rises are happening, the economy's really bounced off these 50-year lows with a whole range of of building and development, you know, being put on the back burner. And, you know, the interest rates we've got now, we haven't seen the kind of rapid tightening for a decade. 
You know, we're currently at 2.85% cash rate at the time of speaking now in November, and we're probably going to get another 25 basis point hike in December, and that'll take the cash rate to 3.1%. So that 3.1% will be the highest cash rate we've had in a decade. So what we've got now, Craig, is this this last decade has really been what we call a credit impulse-induced housing price increase. So now that the uh, that's sort of over, we're going to go back to more normalised rates, but I do think the, uh, the per property prices have just got a little bit further to fall. Yeah. Okay. So sticking with your previous economist hat on, what's been, do you think, the impact of all of the rate rises to date on the property market? Well, these rapid rate rises have really put the the gear stick into reverse for most capital cities. Sydney at the moment in November of 2022 is is down 8.6%. Melbourne's down 5.6%. Brisbane's still up. Uh, at 8.4%. Adelaide's still up. Perth is up 4%. Hobart's down 1%. Um, Darwin's down 49 and Canberra's just up 1%. Now, they're year-to-date figures. But again, remember, all of those figures are around two to three months out of date as well, because we're not seeing the actual live numbers coming through there, as I say, two to three months out of date. So I think Sydney's probably declined around 15%. Melbourne's around 10%. But there's still good opportunities out there. So don't be surprised in the next six months that you see a few more declines and and some of the really rapid markets like Adelaide and Brisbane start to slow down. What this impact of interest rate rises has done is really slow borrowers. Borrowing capacity has been very, very strongly curtailed, up to around 20% at the moment. So the borrowers are very hesitant to take on more debt and they just don't have the ability to, to borrow more money and therefore push the housing prices higher. Yeah. And sticking with those borrowers, Rich, to what extent do you believe that borrowers are under mortgage stressing versus serious distress? And I guess the next part of that is, do you expect there to be any forced selling of property in the near future? Well, it's funny, you know, I was yesterday sitting in the boardroom of the UBS. I got invited in to speak with their economists and some of their top uh, hedge fund managers. And they were asking this question, are you seeing any evidence of forced selling out there? And we're saying, absolutely not. You know, most people have got decent buffers. So interesting, some of the lenders that I'm talking to have actually reported a decline in mortgage arrears and delinquency. And that's because we've got a situation of full employment. Everyone who wants a job can have a job. If you need to work extra hours, you can work the extra hours. So there's no excuse not to be able to pay your mortgage. It's just that people perhaps don't want to go out and work as hard. So we've got record low vacancies, rising rents. Don't don't get me wrong. There is going to be some significant mortgage stress. And where it's going to come from is everyone who's coming off these fixed rate loans. Because during September to December of 2021, there was a rapid rise in the number of people taking out fixed rate mortgages. So they were really written at around 2%. When it gets to sort of, you know, June, July of 2023, all of those people that were paying 2% on their mortgage loans are now going to be paying a mortgage rate of around 5.5%. So that's almost two and a half times their repayment level. So I think that's a period of time when you'll definitely see people feel the pain, but I'm not expecting there to be widespread pain and you know blood on the streets. You know, people say, oh, well, look, I'll wait to buy a property then. At the end of the day, it's all about you know choosing the right location and the right kind of property. The other interesting thing, Greg, is that during the GFC, I would have expected to see a significant rise in mortgage delinquencies. But in fact, the needle didn't move that much. So I'm pretty much expecting the same thing to happen next year. Yes, there will be more stress. There'll be a lot more headlines about it, but I don't expect there to be a significant number of forced sellers out there. Yeah, that's really interesting. And we know the RBA made some bold statements about rates staying on hold and then backtracked on those words earlier this year. How do you, Rich Harvey, determine what to believe in this current climate? Well, there's a big difference between actual interest rate rises and what I call the jawboning effect of the RBA. That is what they put out in media releases and their statements and, you know, their various conferences that they hold. They put out a lot of rhetoric and and the financial markets react strongly to that. And what they're trying to do is to 
condition the market to an expectation of where rates might sit and what their monetary policy is going to be, but then they don't always do that. And those financial markets, they tend to overshoot or undershoot on the basis of those expectations. So on the buy side, you've got many prospective buyers sitting there cautiously listening to this reserve bank rhetoric for signs that we're approaching what we call the terminal cash rate. In other words, the interest rate that won't go any higher. So it's a pretty narrow path that the Reserve Bank's got to tread, and it's got to use some pretty tough language there, and it can't take interest rates too high, otherwise it's going to stall the economy and you'll get a recession. So they're watching the data all the time and making a decision around that. So in my view, I reckon we've probably got at least one more interest rate rise in December, which will take us to 3.1% cash rate, and then depending on how impactful that is on reducing inflation, we may see another one or we might just see it sit at that level for some time. Yeah, and I I guess because we've got that one coming in December, that lag effect starts to kick in as well. So staying with the RBA, has the Reserve Bank, do you think, learnt its lesson? Is there a lesson to be learnt here in the way that the RBA articulates to financial markets? Well, Dr. Lowe, who's the governor of the Reserve Bank, apologised in his own kind of way by saying, oh, in retrospect, I shouldn't have said that interest rates won't rise anytime soon or before 2024. He was very definitive. And I think a lot of borrowers geared up thinking, oh, great, going to have low low cash rate for quite a while. But the thing is, the Reserve Bank's got even more economic data than ever before at its fingertips. And it's monitoring that on a monthly and quarterly basis, particularly around inflation. So it used to get quarterly figures. Now it can get monthly monthly figures. So it can be more nimble and more responsive to the economic conditions and change the monetary policy settings. But I think the main issue with the Reserve Bank is that everyone expects interest rates to do all the heavy lifting to make changes in the economy. But in fact, Craig, interest rates are quite a blunt instrument. All they do is change the price of money. There's going to be much bigger impacts, and the Reserve Bank doesn't have the remit to do this. This is the government of the day has to do this, is to change fiscal policy, such as revising property taxation, getting rid of stamp duty, improving industrial relations, improving productivity, improving housing supply. So the Reserve Bank's got a really important function to provide financial stability for the economy, but it's got to be very careful in the way they communicate um, their intentions and expectations, because that can dramatically impact influence how financial markets respond. Yeah. And when it comes to monetary policy, of course, we could be here all day (laughs) discussing the RBA, couldn't we? Let's uh, pivot a little bit. Let's change to having a look at some of these migrants that are starting to flood. And I think that that's probably the word. They really are starting to flood the market. Absolutely. Look, this is my final point, and it's really the number of temporary visa holders has come rocketing back. We've really seen an increase of over half a million, that's 503,000 over the year to the end of September. And that's another significant impact on the economy. It's going to help, obviously, all the businesses that need labour force, and it's going to really impact uh, the property market. So we've already got low vacancies, and we've got all these migrants coming back in. So I think we're going to see the migrant levels surpassing what we had pre-COVID. And we're going to see a population increasing by another 3 million people. That's from 26 million to 29 people by the end of 2030. And you know what that equates to, Craig? That equates to much higher demand for housing over the next decade. Yeah, a lot of people coming in. Rich Harvey, once again, thanks for coming back onto the Real Estate Podcast. Enjoy your Friday, your weekend, and catch you back next week. Thanks, Craig. Great to be with you. We connect you to the best real estate information across Australia. The Real Estate Podcast.